Good morning, everyone, and uh, welcome to this new day in the Cryosphere Pavilion. Today, our focus is sea ice and the polar oceans, and uh, we have a very full schedule. We apologize for starting a bit late. There's a, a bit of an issue with the technology. Those of you online at this point are not seeing uh, a split screen PowerPoint, but you're going to be able to see the entire picture and the, the PowerPoint behind the speaker. Um, I will say that we do post all uh, presentations that, that where we have permission to do that as PDFs in a Dropbox, so you will be able to look at the presentations more closely after the fact, uh, and we'll try and get this fixed in the course of the day. So without waiting any longer, um, I would like to introduce Kirsty Crockett from the University of Edinburgh, who is our moderator for the first event. Thank you, Pam. And thank you everyone for coming to this side event. So my name's Kirsty, and I am the science coordinator of the Changing Arctic Ocean Research Program. So in this side event, we're going to look at some of the scientific evidence uh, of climate change impacts on the Arctic Ocean and the implications of these and the policy response. So I'll first introduce the topic before welcoming the first speaker. So we know that the Arctic is responding to global climate change and average temperatures are increasing. And in fact, recent estimates now place the rates of Arctic warming at two to three times that of the global average. So this figure here highlights the average global air temperature anomaly in October 2019. And the red colors over the Arctic emphasize those higher rates of warming relative to the rest of the world. And here you can see the Arctic Ocean surrounded by North America, Russia, and Northern Europe. And the dark red colors show how warming is very much focused over parts of the Arctic Ocean. And the clearest and most visual indication of this warming is the loss of sea ice. So you'll hear more about sea ice from a couple of our speakers shortly. So if we have continued warming leading to further retreat of sea ice, we will also see a new physical state of the Arctic Ocean emerge. And this will have a monumental impact on the marine biology and ecosystems of the Arctic Ocean, which rely on the presence of sea ice. So why is it important to know about these changes to Arctic Ocean ecosystems? And what are the consequences of these changes? And what can we expect to happen as we go from this, a frozen seascape, to this open water? And this transition could happen within the next 20 to 30 years during the summer months. And for winter, recent business as usual model projections, or RCP 8.5, indicate we may reach this ice-free winter scenario before the end of the century. So it's important to know about change in the Arctic Ocean because sea ice provides the physical platform and the chemical environment which these unique Arctic Ocean ecosystems rely on, and importantly, on which many ecosystem services are also based. For example, fisheries and carbon sequestration. But it's much harder to measure change to Arctic Ocean ecosystems than it is to measure change in sea ice. But as surely as the sea ice is shrinking, so the marine ecosystems are also changing. And we need to know how they are changing and what this means for feedback effects to global climate and also for us. So this is where the Changing Arctic Ocean Research Program comes in. 
uh, which I would briefly like to mention. It focuses on understanding and quantifying the impact of uh, climate change on Arctic Ocean ecosystems and also the implications for marine biology and biogeochemistry. So the programme has £20 million of research funding from both uh, the UK Research and Innovation Natural Environment Research Council and the German Federal Ministry of Education and Research. And I'd like to emphasise that this is the first time a research programme has dual national funding from both the UK and Germany together. So in this side event, we're going to hear from seven speakers, some policy, some science, and they will present the scientific evidence of change, outline the current and future implications of this change, and the policy response. So our first speaker is Mr. Tim Eder of the German Federal Ministry of Education and Research. So uh, Tim is a policy officer in the Marine, Coastal and Polar Research Division of the Ministry where he has worked since 2016. Um, his responsibilities include the funding of ocean and coastal research at national level and in international cooperation. And one example of this international cooperation is the Changing Arctic Ocean uh, Research Programme. So he's going to talk to us about science for evidence-based decision-making, the German Arctic research strategy. Yes, good morning, everyone. Uh, a warm welcome also on behalf of the Federal Ministry for Education and Research in Germany, the BMBF. And uh, thank you, Kirsty, for the introduction, and uh, also for organizing this Changing Arctic Ocean site event. I would like to also thank the hosts of this Cryosphere Pavilion for making this event possible. Um, Germany partici partici participates in the Changing Arctic Ocean site event uh, in, in the research program um, since 2018 with 12 bilateral projects. Um, it was started from NERC funding with four projects, and Germany um, got into the program afterwards. And I'm really impressed with the pace this project has taken and with the profound commitment of both sides, policy as well as research. In September this year, the IPCC released the special report on the oceans and cryosphere. And it made very clear the oceans and the cryosphere are at risk. And the rate of change is mostly accelerating in the last years. Researchers have identified atropogenic change and its severe consequences for human and nature alike in the first place, many years ago. And this has finally led to the Paris Agreement of 2015. BMBF considers the IPCC reports as the most important source of information from science to climate policy. During the last year, the IPCC has published three special reports, all with the same key message. We need drastic emission reductions in the next few years. But, however, cutting emissions alone will not be enough. We also need to adapt and we need to improve our capabilities for modeling, for forecasts and for predictions. The Arctic is driver and regulator of the climate in the Northern Hemisphere and is also key to understanding global climate change. At the same time, the Arctic, as we heard just before, is warming currently twice as fast as the global average. To mitigate these developments and to adapt where mitigation fails, we need a better understanding of regional and global implications of this Arctic change. This was also highlighted in a recent publication by Lenton and others about climate tipping points and the growing threat of abrupt and irreversible changes. Nine tipping points were identified that could have profound implications and consequences for local and global environmental processes as well as societies. These tipping points their triggers, as well as their positioning in current predictions and models, are not yet fully understood. Yet, the projects funded in the Changing Arctic Oceans program address some of these tipping points, as you can see in the slide here. A science-based science policy can only be developed with accurate knowledge about possible future developments and scenarios, and scientific findings need to be the groundwork of national and international climate policies. The German research ministry, BMBF, responds to this need by supporting research that is particularly relevant to understanding Arctic climate change. Our aim is to make efficient and outcome-oriented research possible by funding, but also by supporting national and international dialogue. 
This dialogue should happen between researchers and policymakers to create an interface. This all is built on our federal research program for coastal, marine and polar research, MAREN, and also the broader strategies like Germany's Arctic policy guidelines, which were really newly released this year. For the Arctic region, region the Bilateral Changing Arctic Oceans program is one of the cornerstones of our funding. The initiative addresses a wide range of projects and topics with a focus on the complex interactions between the atmosphere, the cryosphere and the biosphere. Without going into detail, I would like to highlight research on permafrost thaw, on possible carbon and methane release, on Arctic ecosystem changes in food webs, as well as changing abiotic conditions. With this broad approach, the Changing Arctic Oceans program will, be, will enable us to support decision-making processes at different levels, from valuable data and more precise climate models to science-based advice on marine ecosystem management. On national level, I would also like to highlight the GROWS project that deals and investigates the interaction of Greenland's melting glaciers with the atmosphere and the ocean, since the Greenland ice shield is in acute danger even in low emission scenarios. Another cornerstone of our funding is, of course, the Mosaic Expedition, led by the Alfred Wegener Institute, that started in September this year in Norway, with also a high commitment from the United Kingdom. 600 scientists are studying for the first time the northernmost region of the world for a full year and obtain the much needed data for more precise climate models. In 2018, BMBF has hosted, together with the European Commission and Finland, the second Arctic Science Ministerial, with the working group on a forum of Arctic Science funders as a follow-up. The ministerial has led to a joint statement by the participating ministries and representatives for future Arctic research perspectives. So with the numerous of activities, we focus on Arctic science for evidence-based decision-making, for a better understanding and sustainable use of the Arctic Ocean. Thank you very much. I'll be happy to answer questions afterwards. Thank you very much, Tim. So our next speaker is, let me just get the slides up. Is Mr. Bo Storank. So Bo is a senior specialist at the Ministry of the Environment in Finland. He specializes in promoting international cooperation, including Nordic uh, in the Balt Baltic Sea region. And he's also part of the Nordic Working Group for Climate and Air. So Bo is going to talk to us about Nordic cooperation on oceans and climate. Thank you, Kosti. And uh, I would also like to say thank you to the organizers of this event for having this opportunity to say a few words about the Nordic cooperation on oceans and climate. I also hope that this my presentation will give you a bit of better understanding of some of the efforts the Nordic countries will take in the next few years when it comes to, to oceans and climate change. Um, the Nordic seas will be increasingly affected by climate change and uh, acidification. And this is not taking place only in the Arctic region. Uh, also the Baltic Sea will suffer from rising temperatures. By the way, this uh, photo is actually from the Baltic Sea. A vulnerable but also very diverse sea with a thick ice cover winter time well, at least in the northern parts. A year ago, uh, the Nordic Ministers for Climate and Environment decided to promote a more efficient and relevant management of marine ec ecosystems in a changing <coughs> climate. And that would also include protection and sustainable use of the sea. The first step was the establishment of a Nordic ad hoc expert group on marine ecosystems. And in October this year, 
the ministers, that is the Ministers for Climate and Environment, took the following action. Uh, that is, um, they adopted a declaration on ocean and climate at the meeting in Stockholm. Um, the cake is actually celebrating one other milestone in the Nordic cooperation, that is the 30th uh, anniversary of the Nordic Swan, that is an eco-label you may find on thousands of products if you visit the Nordic region. In this uh, declaration, uh, the Nordics sends a clear message. We have a long tradition of cooperation, and when it comes to oceans and climate change, uh, we are ready to join the forerunners on the global level. I will just here point out some of the themes we will work on in the coming years. First of all, we will do our best to increase our knowledge about the ocean and the interaction uh, with, with climate. Um, and also uh, recognize the, the effects this has on people dependent on the sea, that is indigenous peoples and local communities. Uh, so just to give you an example, we all know about the IPCC report on 1.5 degree and also the report on the ocean and the cryosphere. Um, I'm sure that you also are familiar with the report on biodiversity uh, published by IPBES. And um, we have actually made a review on this when it comes to the what we could call perhaps the Nordic perspective findings that could be uh, important uh, when when we are planning and, and, and uh, developing the further activities. Um, I'm sure that, that uh, monitoring is a key word. It was actually mentioned already in the, in the previous uh, presentation. And um, this is something that, that the Nordics also will work on. That is, we have something we call the Argo program that is uh, drifting ocean floats in the Nordic Sea regions. And this is one, one method we could use when, when um, gathering further information about the changes in our northern sea regions. Marine protected areas, they are a very important piece of the puzzle. Uh, in practice, we will compile an overview of, of existing marine protected areas uh, plans for, for the future and in that way get a better understanding of, of one of the very basic, basic elements when talking about uh, long-term sustainable management of, of the oceans. <coughs> and carbon sinks also a key word. Um, here we will also look into what's going around in the Nordic areas. Uh, we used to also call these for these uh, important habitats uh, blue forests. Uh, you know we have green forests especially in Finland, Sweden and Norway but um, personally I find this blue forest concept or, or term really appealing. Uh, and finally, uh, last but not least, um, the Nordic Council of Ministers is also very much working on, on uh, uh, outreach activities. We very much like to involve uh, young people in, in, in our work. And recently, for instance, we produced a video telling about the, the Nordic Sea's climate change and also highlighting the voice of, of uh, young people. So if you would like to have more information, you can always uh, contact me or have a look at our website. Thank you. Thank you very much, Bo. So our next speaker is Dr. Carol Turley. 
So Carol um, is based at uh, the Plymouth Marine Laboratory in the UK. She has been a member of the author team for IPCC assessments since 2005 and was also a reviewer for, editor for the IPCC special report on ocean cryosphere and climate. Uh, so Carol has raised ocean issues at side events at COP climate conferences since 2009 and has briefed a wide range of stakeholders, including UK government departments. So Carol has also presented in the UK and EU parliaments, um, the Our Ocean Conference in the US State Department and at the UN Ocean Conference. Um, she's one of the scientists in the PETRA project, part of the Changing Arctic Ocean program, and uh, Carol is now going to talk about cycling of key climate reactive trace gases in a changing Arctic Ocean. Thank you, Carol. Thank you very much. Um, and thank you for organising this as well. So she's not just moderator, she actually pulled us all together and organised it very effectively. My thanks also to Pam Pearson sitting at the back of the room there for bringing the cryosphere from, from Chile to Madrid. Thank you for that. That's quite a shift of ice. Um, so just a resume of what's happening in the ocean. It's taking up around 20% of the man-produced CO2. Um, it also provides around 50% of the natural sources of dimethyl sulfide, so a really important climate reactive gas, and around 30% of laughing gas, uh, nitrous oxide, and around 10% uh, of methane. And the, these are trace gases, they're, very, they're not really addressed uh, to a great degree in, in SROC, and, and it's because the science of finding out uh, fluxes in such a difficult area to work in is, is, is challenging, to say the least. So that's what we're trying to do. And uh, I just want to bring home the fact that the Arctic is acidifying at a faster rate than any other part of the ocean. And this is aragonite saturation, which is a, a, a calcium carbonate uh, mineral, which is important for uh, many uh, shelled organisms. Uh, and you will see how quickly the Arctic Ocean is changing. And as it reaches uh, around one, as it moves into the red, it's actually corrosive to unprotected shelled shells. And it, it also means that it's more difficult for, for organisms to make their structures as well. It requires more energy. Um, so I think we've brought home how important acidification is, but also uh, the Arctic is, is losing uh, sea ice. It's thinning and it's contracting, and I'm sure we'll hear more about it. And of course it's warming at the same time. So putting these three elements together, um, what would be the combined impact? Uh, would it be additive? synergistic or antagonistic in terms of the pr production and flux of trace gases from the ocean into the atmosphere. And it's these feedbacks to the climate system that we know so little about that could actually be hugely important. And they're driven by mostly by the organisms that live in the Arctic. And it's mainly the small ones that drive this. And you can see here on this schematic that uh, the phytoplankton and zooplankton are very important sources of DMS and methane. And uh, the microbial, the bacterial, tiny little things in, in the ocean actually are really important in driving the nitrogen cycle and the production uh, of uh, nitrous oxide. Um, and of course, these things create organic matter and decompose organic matter and it's this whole biogeochemical process that's important. In addition to that you've got UV and the effect of UV um, lysis of organic matter. Now the ice, sea ice has acted as a kind of a barrier for UV protecting, potentially protecting that organic matter. So what we want to look at as well is the impact of UV lysis on the organic matter. 
So this is uh, the gases we'll be looking at, nitrous oxide, very important greenhouse gas, methane similarly, a DMS is very important in aerosol formation, and carbon monoxide, uh, important greenhouse and, um, uh, as well. And we'll be looking at the different stresses, warming, acidification, and in, in term, terms of DMS and carbon monoxide, uh, the UV as well. So this means going to sea in difficult conditions, um, popping in and out of, of, of the sea ice, um, and doing really detailed high resolution measurements at, along the surface, but also at depth as well. And actually to, to try and find out how the organisms themselves react to the changes of um, the acidity, the, the warming, and UV, it means doing shipboard experiments, looking at uh, a combination of stresses. So these are, tend to be quite complex experiments that look at multiple factors um, in order to, to really work out the combined effects of these stresses on, on these trace gases. And to really help interpret the, the, the uh, experimental impacts, we use ecosystem models to explore the, those impacts further and the wider, in the wider stressor space. And these are com quite complex models. This is the Ursa model that has, interacts with the atmosphere, the pelagic, the watery part of the system, as well as the sediment, and it, it has the, um, the, the different phytoplankton and zooplankton groups, different microbial processes, and different uh, nutrients, uh, like uh, the nitrogen that drives primary production, but also the sulfur cycle and the carbonate cycle within that. And uh, so far, the nitrous oxide uh, model is working and published. The DMS one is underway. It's, I think it's coming out shortly, and we're using the uh, ex results from the experiments to uh, from from this these field trips um, to develop the carbon monoxide and uh, methane models. So what we'll end up with the, the project's only a year or two into development. There's still a lot of analysis to do. Is high resolution spatial distribution of these gases. Improved air sea fluxes in regions of sea ice, which will be very novel, and experimental evidence of the changing Arctic Ocean impacts on the trace gases, and hopefully a greater mechanical understanding of stressor impacts of the trace gases themselves. Hot off the press are uh, these series of histograms, which is a series of uh, these multi-layered experiments and. I don't want to go into detail, um, but the trend for uh, nitrous oxide is uh, decreasing with decreasing pH, uh, but warming seems to have no distinguishable effect. So this is really quite interesting, and if you put that in a global term um, and, and scale it up globally, it, you'll see that the potential reduction of nitrous oxide uh, flux into the atmosphere it could be on a similar scale to that of global production of fossil fuels. So, I mean, all needs verification, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So, this is my final slide. Maybe. Maybe not. Oh, there we go. There's one missing. It's okay. Um, so, if if this if we just t take nitrous oxide on its own. Um, uh, and acidification results in the re reduction uh, of nitrification and therefore N2O release into the atmosphere. This then um, could result in a cooling effect. The feedback could be a cooling effect. And of course, uh, is that a, a laughing matter? I, I, I don't think it's a laughing matter because you've got all these other trace gases having an impact as well. And we don't know how the uh, plankton will change in uh, a future Arctic. So there's a lot more to unpick from this sort of information. So thank you very much for your attention. 
Thank you, Carol. So I'll do a quick slide change. So Dr. Jack Landy from the University of Bristol is our next speaker. Um, Jack is a fellow of the European Space Agency's Earth Observation Program called The Living Planet, and he has expertise in Arctic sea ice and currently leads a research program called PreMelt that investigates the Central Arctic's last ice area. He's also involved in the Changing Arctic Ocean as a scientist in the Diatom Arctic Project. So today Jack's going to talk to us about Arctic sea ice, past and future, a modern era of extraordinary change. Thank you, Jack. Okay, thank you very much, Kirsty. Thank you very much, everyone, for coming and uh, for people tuning in online. Um, so I'm going to show you how the Arctic sea ice cover has been changing since the 1970s when we first began monitoring the Arctic from space. And then I want to try and answer a couple of questions. First, are these changes normal? And then how might the sea ice cover continue to change in a future world that we warm to 1.5 versus 2 degrees above the uh, industrial levels? So my favorite thing to do is to look at Arctic sea ice from space. Um, Arctic sea ice grows in the winter as the ocean water freezes and then contracts and shrinks in the summer as the ice melts. And this plot here shows year-to-year -year changes in the amount of sea ice left at the end of the melt season uh, in the Arctic summer. And you can see these interannual fluctuations here, but we can see also a declining trend. And especially after about the year 2000, this trend downwards seems to be getting steeper and steeper and steeper. We're losing more and more sea ice from the Arctic every year. So over this full record from 1978 to present, we've lost about 13% of our summer sea ice in the Arctic every decade. And uh, what this equates to is about 83,000 square kilometers of sea ice lost every year. So each year in the Arctic, we seem to be gaining more and more unwanted records for the sea ice cover. Uh, for example, the 12 lowest ever recorded sea ice extents in the Arctic have all occurred within the last 12 years. And right now, as we hold this conference here in Madrid, uh, an area of the Arctic Ocean still hasn't actually frozen up, which by the, uh, the middle of December is pretty unprecedented. So this region here in blue, just to the northern coast of Alaska here in the Chukchi Sea, only contains about a fifth of the normal volume of sea ice for this time of year. Why is this? Well, the ocean around the central Arctic ice pack in summer is often completely open every year now, and so it absorbs a lot of heat from the atmosphere, and we have to expel all of that heat back up to the atmosphere before we can start freezing the water again. And in the Chukchi Sea this year, this just hasn't happened yet. So we lose 83,000 square kilometers of sea ice from the Arctic each summer. But if you're anything like me, I find these massive numbers pretty hard to interpret and to comprehend. So what does 83,000 square kilometers of sea ice actually equate to? Well, while I was doing my PhD in Canada, whenever anyone was talking about equating to area, they would always talk about American football fields. So I have to do that myself now. And we lose about 15 million American football fields worth of sea ice each year from the Arctic. This equates also to 137 times the area of Madrid. And on a somber note, it's pretty similar to the amount of woodland that's uh, deforested globally every year, uh, is very similar to the amount of sea ice that we lose from the Arctic during summer months. So my day job is to observe uh, changes in the thickness of sea ice, and we've also seen that the total volume of sea ice in the Arctic has been declining at an even faster rate than its area, and this is because the, the ice is thinning as well as shrinking, as well as kind of contracting an area. Um, and you can see this is especially the case just off the northern coast of, of Greenland and the Canadian Arctic here. You can see in red the very thick ice in 2004 here, and just in the space of a couple of decades, uh, we've had a lot of thinning in this region as well. So as the ice thins, it's more easily pushed around by ocean currents and by winds. And so we've also seen trends for the Arctic sea ice to be speeding up, especially on the eastern side of the Arctic, where you see this, this kind of red blob here. We're getting a really strong speed up of, of ice motion. And this is pushing more and more ice, which is being exported 
out of the Arctic to the North Atlantic, where it can melt more easily. And just to top it all off, uh, we've also observed that certain regions of the Arctic have been melting for longer and longer every year since we started observing the Arctic from space back in the 70s. So, for example, the Chukchi Sea, which still hasn't frozen up properly this year, the amount of time every year that it's melting has increased by a couple of months since the 1970s. Okay, so the first question we have, are these changes normal? Have we ever seen sea ice change this quickly in the past? Well, since the satellite record only lasts for the past few decades, this is a really tough question to answer. And we have to use climate proxies to try and reconstruct past changes in sea ice, just like when we take an ice core through a glacier or an ice sheet to reconstruct past global temperatures. And so these are results from a number of climate proxies which give us the minimum and the maximum likelihood in red there of the sea ice area over the past 1,400 years. And we can see that it's been pretty stable over this time at about 10 million square kilometers. And it's only within these last few decades where we've got this precipitous decline. And this is where we are now. And this means that both the rate and the magnitude of these recent declines in sea ice are unprecedented over 1,400 years. So let's try and go even further back. And this study here used a variety of proxies including uh, pieces of driftwood that had frozen into sea ice and been transported across the Arctic to the northern coast of Greenland to try to, to reconstruct 10,000 years of Arctic sea ice changes. And although these, can't, uh, these records can't give you year-to-year -year or even decade-to-decade -decade variations, they can give us sort of long-term changes. And so we see from these records that the, the last period with very low sea ice in the Arctic uh, was about 6,000 to 8,000 years ago. But there was still some ice in the Arctic at this time. It wasn't ice-free like we're heading to today. And just to put this into context, this marked the growth of the very first uh, Neolithic cities in ancient Mesopotamia. Over the next 4,000 years, Arctic sea ice area increased uh, and then leveled off at sort of the, the contemporary uh, Holocene values at um, about 2,500 years ago. And that's where we meet our, our previous study here. So it's only since the 1950s onwards that we've got this really steep decline. And what this means is that the, the rate of sea ice decline that we've seen in the last couple of decades is therefore unprecedented over at least 6,000 years. So many scientific studies are in agreement that at least 50% of uh, sea ice loss that we've witnessed in the Arctic since the 70s can only be explained by human greenhouse gas emissions. Um, as we increase the amount of CO2 in the atmosphere, this drives faster warming of the Arctic's atmosphere and ocean, and this leads to faster and faster rates of sea ice loss. So it's not therefore very surprising when we get uh, a strong relationship between increasing CO2 emissions and decreasing sea ice area in the Arctic. And what this equates to is about three square meters of sustained summer sea ice loss per metric ton of CO2 that we emit into the atmosphere. And this means, personally for me, my flight from Bristol to Madrid here is equal to about one to two square meters of sea ice loss from the Arctic. So the second question we have is, are these changes uh, going to continue into the future? Um, so this is a plot from the recent IPCC SROC report, which shows uh, results from a number of groups all around the world who've modeled uh, future changes in Arctic sea ice up into the end of the 21st century. And in blue here, we have projections from a uh, scenario where we take significant global action to curb man-made CO2 emissions. And in red, this is our business as usual, uh, accelerating CO2 emission scenario. And you can see that for our, our uh, global action scenario, we level off the decline in sea ice at around 50% lower than the long-term average at about 2050. But for our runaway emission scenario, what we're presently on, we're very likely to have an ice-free Arctic summer between 2050 and 2100. But it can be hard to understand the practical implications of these different climate change scenarios. So uh, perhaps a better way of looking at this is to try to look at what the sea ice cover uh, may look like in, if we meet the two different targets of the 2016 Paris Agreement. So each year we roll a dice and we have uh, the chances on the left here of having an ice-free Arctic that year. So if we stabilize warming at 1.5 degrees pre above pre-industrial, we have a 1% chance of the Arctic being ice-free. If we stabilize warming at two degrees above pre-industrial, we have a 10 to 35% chance of the Arctic being ice-free that year. Of course, as we keep rolling our dice every year, we accumulate our rods, they get longer and longer. And this means that 
between these two different scenarios, for the 1.5 degree scenario, if we stabilize warming at that level by 2050, we're only 60% likely to have a single ice-free Arctic summer by 2100. But at the two degrees warming above pre-industrial, it's almost certain that we're going to have at least one ice-free Arctic summer by 2100. So what have we discovered here? Well, we lose more than 15 million football fields of sea ice from the Arctic every year. The ice is getting thinner, more malleable, it moves around more quickly, and it melts more easily. Modern rates of sea ice loss within the past couple of decades are unprecedented over at least 1,400 years. And CO2 emissions drive a lot of the observed um, sea ice losses that we've seen. But to end on a positive note, um, if we do manage to keep global warming stabilised at the 1.5 degree target of the Paris Agreement, this could have really positive implications for the future of the, the Arctic sea ice cover. Thank you. Thank you for a great talk, Jack. Just do a quick slide change. So our next speaker is Dr. Yevgeny Aksinov. Um, he's also an expert on uh, Arctic sea ice, and he's a senior research fellow at the National Oceanography Centre in the UK. And his research focuses on global modeling of ocean circulation and sea ice dynamics. And he is co-lead investigator in the APEAR project, uh, part of the Changing Arctic Ocean program. Uh, so Yevgeny is going to talk to us about the new Arctic, the impact of change in Arctic Ocean sea ice on marine ecosystems and maritime industries. Um, hello, um, uh, thanks very much Kirsty, for introduction and thanks to you all who join us here physically and online. Um, I'm Evgeny and I lost my moustaches overnight, if you can see, I don't have moustaches. Um, I'm going to um, focus on the, um, in a way, extreme case of the, of the change in the Arctic. So the, the previous speaker um, lay out very nicely the possibilities of different um, mitigation scenarios of what may happen with the sea ice in the Arctic. And also I'm going to focus on slightly different subjects. I'm going to talk about the ocean more than about sea ice, but I'll definitely mention sea ice. It's an important part of the story. So these slides represent uh, uh, actually the, 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 the variety and diversity of the teams involved in this project. So we have people from Norway, UK, France, Germany, Russia, and um, um, United States. Uh, all of them are contributing to the specific theme, and uh, I acknowledge their contribution in this specific presentation. Um, uh, what I'm going to talk about, uh, hopefully it works. Yeah. I'm going to talk about the changes in the Arctic, considering uh, high risk scenarios and also uh, change related to the sea ice ocean waves and icebergs and i'm going to talk about the uh, some um, aspects of the risks for the industries and the ecosystems i'm not going to go cover the whole subject it's too broad clearly but i'll focus on the uh, key issues i hope um this is the classical um, post the pictures of the CIS retreat, and this is 2017, 18, and if you plot this year, it will be exactly the same. So one of the features uh, shown here, as been mentioned in the previous talk, there's a very strong uh, negative trends in CIS retreat in the, uh, on, the, on the Alaskan side of the, of the, of the Arctic, and practically ocean ice free. What that actually means, um, this is slightly challenging you to the usual posters and pictures we see about the Arctic, uh, very pristine, calm waters, blue sky, and very white sea ice. We got waves, right? So if you have an ocean, op open ocean about several hundred miles across, you start getting waves in the storms. And that has been actually proven by the uh, publication by uh, Jim Thompson <coughs> and uh, co-workers. They look at the buoy data in the Arctic Ocean and also in the model results, which is the panel on the right. They show the uh, wave heights in the Arctic in August 2012 during the very large Arctic storm. So waves reach excess of five meters and more, basically, which is quite substantial for the Arctic Ocean. Why is this important? This is <coughs> clearly important for several aspects. First of all, this is the safety general of the offshore operation shipping, but also it's important, for example, for the coastal erosion. So more waves means more coastal erosion or coastal retreat and all more material coming from the land to the ocean. And also it impacts on the sea ice decline in the ocean system as a whole. 
Uh, what else happens in the Arctic? Uh, well, uh, start from the currents. Currents do tend to accelerate. So Arctic is very calm, quiescent environment. Most of the currents are very sluggish and very slow, except for the currents along the shelf slope. And the projections do show that these currents do accelerate substantially to the degree of 50 to 60 percent. Why it's important? Uh, if you have a current uh, coming over the sea mountain or sea mountain the topography, it degenerates into turbulence, which starts disturbing waters and bringing the waters upwards. And if you look at the bottom left plot, this is the temperatures of the so-called Atlantic layer in the Arctic, which is very warm layer of the waters. So imagine this start pumping out heat up to the uh, surface, which means more sea ice decline. So this is very has very strong implications for the sea ice decline and climate change. What else? Uh, I mentioned waves. So the top right picture shows the current uh, like decadal climatology of the waves in the Arctic. What you can really see that Arctic actually very quiet in terms of the waves. North Atlantic is very stormy clearly. What happens if you remove ice? Well, we practically get the same weather as in North Atlantic. You start getting very large waves. You start getting waves 9 meters high, 10 meters high, 12 meters high in some cases, which potentially could have very strong implications for the shelf seas. Um, another example, uh, we talk about the warming of the ocean from the surface, specifically if you have exposure of the ocean to the sunlight and radiation. We also have a second mechanism, which means bringing heat from outside, bringing heat from the Atlantic Ocean. And these pictures on the left column show the, again, sea surface temperatures uh, current day, and then sea surface temperatures projected towards the end of the century. You can clearly see that Atlantic will start playing a role, and the Arctic surface warming due to Atlantic flows very substantially, which means it contributes to the ice decline. It's not only the reason, but it's, it's one of the key reasons for the sea ice decline. Uh, if you still have sea ice, it's not a continuous plate. So if you look at the uh, bottom right picture, this is the sea ice pack in 1990s. You have practically continuous ice. This is the uh, springtime. You have ridges, a pile up of the ice. What happens now? Something like a uh, top right picture, basically. Ice is broken, fragmented. You have small ice flows. You have open water in between the flows. You're absorbing solar radiation, and this ice is much more mobile. And this is called fragmented ice zone, marginal ice zone, or broken ice zone. And there's a studies from satellites and models on the left, uh, top top left, show this fraction of the energy increasing. Sea ice is decreasing, but this fraction is increasing. So, so sea ice becoming more fragmented, as Jack mentioned before, is actually much more mobile, partly because of that. And this picture challenges the most of the plots we see about the Arctic change. Well, this is what we have now. This is what we do have in the Arctic in uh, spring or sometimes autumn time when we have ice formation. This came from Beaufort Sea, and it shows two things. First of all, you have waves. That's one thing, quite substantial ones. In this case, maybe in excess of two meters. But also, you have very fragmented sea ice. This is so-called pancake ice. So sea ice is not continuous cover anymore in these areas. It's very, very broken. Uh, some implications. I start from the one interesting and uh, key thing. This is biology and the invasive species, basically. So there's examples of the Pacific species found in the North Atlantic. Why it happens? It happens partly because we got a warm nighting. The sea, sea surface temperature on general ocean temperatures goes up. So this uh, species can survive the winter season. But also the transit time, the travel time to cross the Arctic from Bering Strait to the Atlantic goes down by roughly 30% in the future. So potentially we can have invaders from the Pacific into the Arctic Ocean, but also in the North Atlantic. Another example, this is a hypothesis uh, and the from National Ocean Geography Center put forward. We have changes in the North Atlantic ecosystem, which seems to be goes in opposite direction in the Arctic Ocean. So practically two uh, ocean basins are converging to the ecosystem. So it's, it's a bit of a complicated plot. Um, just try to show what it happens. This uh, line show the availability of the nutrients in the present day, uh, on the right, red arrow, and availability of the nutrients in the future, green arrow. So price you have a convergence of the nutrients, but also have convergence of the production of the of the of the biology there. Which means Arctic may become very similar to the North Atlantic. Uh, aspect of the shipping. Um, there's a lot of publications, I was just part of uh, one, I actually one, led one of the publications, which discuss what potentially may happen with the ship in the Antarctic Ocean. What does happen? If you have uh, sea ice retreat, you clearly is the situation for the shipping and accessibility. This is fine. You can have a reduction in the sailing times. Potentially, some lighter vessels can sail. 
the problem is one of the problems for example this is the icebergs and specifically small bits of icebergs um, carved or released from the uh, Greenland ice sheet and they it can reach Arctic and they are not very detectable by the any means so they could be quite dangerous and amazingly enough 100 years of the Titanic catastrophe we got another one basically which uh, related to the icebergs um, Another point is, if something happened in the Arctic, it's very difficult to uh, mitigate the consequences of pollution. So this plot shows a virtual release of the pollution in the Arctic Ocean along the North Sea Road. One of the features is that if these pollutions can be picked up by the, uh, uh, by the recovery team, the proxy could propagate to the Arctic Ocean uh, itself, into the Arctic Ocean itself, but also in the North Atlantic quite fast. So this is not an Arctic problem, it's, it's, it's practically becoming a global problem. Well, some kind of summary. So if you look at the waves, uh, the, the risks of the Arctic Ocean from the waves and sea ice at the current, uh, present climate, which seems to be have an increase in, this, in, in the sense of the risks. So if you look at the projections of the risk from the waves, specifically uh, loads and forces and pressure on the structures and ships, uh, say in the 2030s, you can see that they actually wave risk start to overcome the ice risks. And if you try to project this for the uh, navigational purposes, a large area of the Arctic still have a risk, uh, area of the high risk for the, for the shipping, basically. That's some kind of message I'll probably try to get across. It's not, the, the easing of ice condition doesn't initially complete elimination of the risks. The new risks come into the play. And summary. Uh, well, uh, key changes. Uh, I focus on the changes in the current waves to some extent and uh, sea ice. So these are also a significant part of the story in the Arctic change. I did consider the extreme scenario without mitigation clearly. So if there's a mitigation process, these things may be different, can be easier and better. Um, in terms of risk for the ecosystems and the biogeochemistry, chemistry, uh, the main thing is practically changing of the ecosystem, complete loss of the Arctic ecosystem. So invasion by different species of the area, general uh, loss of ecosystem due to changes of conditions, warming and removal of sea ice. Environmental risks. Um, changes in the environment are linked together. They couple changes. You cannot consider one uh, part of the environment separately. You need to consider the whole system. So basically, ocean interacts with the sea ice, with the atmosphere and produces the, the joint couple impact and the changes in the, in the climate. Industrial risks. Industry uh, do develop in the Arctic Ocean and they will develop in the Arctic Ocean. We need to consider carefully what risks they, they bring, basically. And I think I'll stop here. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you. <coughs> Thank you, Evgeny. Right, so our next speaker is Dr. Jeff Abbott from uh, Newcastle University. He specializes in the evaluation of um, organic matter in marine and sedimentary environments and how its source and reactivity in contrasting regions of sea ice cover uh, can be used to assess the impact on carbon and nutrient cycling. And Jeff is also part of the CHAOS project, one of the Changing Arctic Ocean uh, projects. So, and Jeff's going to talk to us about the changing Arctic Ocean, exploring the impacts on seafloor biogeochemistry. Thank you, Kirsty, and thank you for allowing me the opportunity to talk about our most recent research on the Arctic. Um, the focus is on uh, the biogeochemistry of, this, of the system. We've already heard about the sustained Arctic sea ice ret retreat, the increased seasonal and inter interannual variability. And just to give another idea of the size of the change, during the past 30 years, we've seen about 2.4 million square kilometers of Arctic sea ice lost. And that's equivalent to an area the size of Western Europe, Spain, Portugal, France, Germany, the UK. A huge, a huge decrease. So not only has there been um, sea ice retreat, there is also sea ice thinning. And this is also linked to the ice albedo feedback loop. 
So as uh, which is a, a well-known effect with the retreating sea ice we're seeing um, more light and heat being absorbed by the darker colors of the ocean and therefore we see an acceleration in the warming effect as we get as we get less solar energy being reflected and this also or also impacts on the global uh, global warming trend so not only that, the fact that um, more light is getting through can promote uh, phytoplankton photosynthesis and because the ice is actually getting thinner there's more uh, evidence that we're seeing more of these under ice phytoplankton blooms, these huge blooms that are taking place as light is able to penetrate more easily uh, through the ice and that organic carbon will take up nutrients it will absorb nutrients and then it will f the, the, one the, once the nutrients are all used up the organic carbon from the phytoplankton will drop to the sea to the sea floor and we've seen this actually in our um, in our research we've had a, we have a number of stations which go from uh, from the south to the north we're going here b3 is to the south and then we're going up to uh, we're going up to b17 which is uh, close, very close uh, under the uh, under the sea ice. Um, the the red arrow shows us the results from 2019, and the the blue and the black from um, the blue and the black for 2017, 2019, 2018 is the red is is the is the red arrow. And what we can see is close to the close to the sea ice edge, we're getting this. A uh, huge increase in this in these derived pigments from chlorophyll, showing this increase in phytoplankton productivity. Okay, so this again shows our sampling stations going from south to to north in the in the project, this multi-institution project, and really the Barents Sea is composed of two parts. We have this we have the southern half, which is. Uh, which has always been influenced by the Atlantic climate regime, and the northern the northern part has been influenced by the uh, by the Arctic climate regime. But what we're seeing is this change in the northern Barents Sea, going from a stratified cold Arctic regime to a warmer, well mixed Atlantic regime, and this has consequences for the carbon sink strength of the sea floor. So from our project which has started 2017 we've had three research cruises and, uh, and, and we've got evidence of for this increased Atlantification in the Barents Sea. So what exactly do we mean by carbon sink strength of the sea floor? Well it means that more carbon dioxide and methane is stored than is actually released back into the water column and back into the atmosphere. Now we know that carbon dioxide and methane are produced during the decay of organic carbon and a fraction, a very small fraction, probably 0.1% of the carbon that's produced can escape decomposition and can accumulate in the sediments and that's very important because that takes it out of the, out of the carbon cycle. The organisms that contribute quantitatively the most organic carbon to the oceans are the plankton, phytoplankton, zooplankton and bacteria. We also shouldn't forget about gas hydrates, these, uh, these complexes of, uh, uh, of methane and, uh, and water and these could be becoming more unstable with rising temperatures and off the island of Svalbard we've had uh, uh, various studies looking at paleomethane emissions. So important questions that we want, we've been looking at, other questions are do changes down core link with benthic in faunal and also microbial activity and as well which I've alluded to already where is organic carbon uh, storage most significant and with these increasing temperatures of retreating sea ice how will this affect future carbon stores so in terms of the benthic bioturbation we have what we did was we compared 2017 where we had 
um, ex uh, extensive sea ice, and have, as we uh, that's missing a slide there. As we get more ice, we see less bioturbation. So more ice, less bioturbation. Then with the uh, microbial communities in the column, we see a clear transition from aerobic dominated groups to anaerobic uh, with depth. And very interestingly, as you go further north, the transition actually gets deeper. We've also looked at the and measured the organic carbon mass accumulation rate and that is accelerating with age as we go closer to the the, the sea ice edge we see b17 the b uh, b17 station we see this rapid increase in carbon accumulation rate so in terms of the oceanographic institute then Station B17 has the highest carbon accumulation rate, but it's also closest to the shelf edge. So this is the position at which we get these mixing of Atlantic and, uh, and, and, and Arctic waters. We see nutrient upwelling coming from the, uh, from the shelf edge. We also have in-ice algal production, and then we get the stimulation of these phytoplankton blooms actually under the ice itself. So all of this means that what we have is benthic bioturbation we've seen plays a key role in the utilization of organic matter that's also promoting microbial activity and carbon storage is the uh, is the highest at B17 which is the northernmost uh, northernmost site so there's a potential in the reduction of the organic carbon story. These factors that I've been discussing are all, ta uh, are all taking place. So I also just want to finalise, uh, summarise and finish on the paper that, was, uh, that came out very recently from Tim Lenton at Exeter University, who looked at how these tipping points are linked together the retreating sea ice to the uh, tipping points in the south such as the Amazon forest dieback etc and I think that I would uh, suggest that his final statement that the stability and resilience of our planet is in peril international action not just words must reflect reflect this so thank you very much for your attention Thank you, Jeff. So, our last speaker I'm delighted to announce is Professor Hans Otto Pertner. <coughs> Hans is Head of Department of Integrative Ecophysiology at the Alfred Wegener Institute in Germany. In 2015, he was elected co chair of IPCC Working Group 2 on Impacts, Adaptation, and Vulnerability for the Sixth Assessment Cycle. And his research interests include the effects of climate warming, ocean acidification, and hypoxia on marine animals and ecosystems, with a focus on the links between ecological, physiological, biogeochemical, and molecular mechanisms that limit tolerance and shape uh, biogeography and ecosystem functioning. So Hans is going to talk to us today about drivers of change in the Arctic Ocean, uh, responses of marine invertebrates and fish. So, thank you, Hans. It's just the up and down keys here. Okay, thank you very much. Yeah, thank you very much for the opportunity to, to speak to you here and to complete this interesting emerging picture about new Arctic findings uh, with some um, results from, from animals and integrating them at the same time in, into the picture emerging from the special report of, of the IPCC on um, ocean and cryosphere in a changing, in a changing climate. If we look at, that was the wrong direction, if we look at uh, the changes happening in, in, in the ocean, uh, we see here the, the global picture, the warming trend and um, uh, the, is also mirrored in the uh, change in global mean surface uh, temperature depending on on the emission scenario with ambitious emissions reductions we would be able to stabilize uh, global 
mean temperature also for the ocean. Nonetheless, we have an increase in marine heat wave uh, days and, and we have a progressive decline of ocean pH, indicating ocean acidification, uh, a trend that can also be stabilized with ambitious emissions um, reduction. Uh, we have some loss of ocean oxygen uh, to be considered, which becomes more severe as climate uh, change proceeds, and we have already seen the slide with the locks in Arctic sea ice uh, cover and so forth. I would like to move um, towards the picture on ocean acidification and the projections haven't really changed very much from the last assessment uh, report during the during the AR5 um, and you see very clearly um, that the Arctic is a hotspot of ocean acidification as as projected um, here due to the uh, melting of of the shelf ice the freshening of the seawater and the loss of its its buffer capacity at uh, cold temperature and you see on this global picture also the ecosystems um, uh, affected and, and in the northern hemisphere. Certainly uh, this concerns uh, the large calcifying e ecosystems of, of the deep water uh, and or cold water uh, calls which range a little bit into the subarctic uh, and the Arctic and, and then there are places where Arctic organisms indicated by the yellow um, and, and orange areas uh, that are uh, used by humans for collecting calcifying organisms for their consumption. We are living on a shifting baseline globally and that concerns especially the Arctic. We are seeing a shift um, in organisms and this is uh, here representing the shift in animal uh, biomass. And, and what you see here on the, on the left-hand side already under the ambitious emissions reduction scenario that we have an impoverishment of animal biomass in the lower latitudes and a push especially of animal biomass into the Arctic. So there are invaders, we heard, heard about that, there is a projection of changing animal communities and uh, we find it difficult currently certainly to envision what actually uh, how the future ecosystems uh, will be looking like in the Arctic. Certainly this is not good news for the endemic uh, species and this is what I would like to go into. And with unabated emissions, as shown on the right sa side, this trend is uh, emphasized. Saying that the modeling projections at the high end towards the really high high latitudes may not be very precise because they do not fully consider the, the Arctic uh, conditions for Arctic life and uh, it, it remains to be seen to what extent biomass is really reaching the levels, will be reaching the levels that are projected here. Future efforts to position those models are needed. And then uh, we are working, um, looking at the cause and effect um, mechanisms here, uh, working uh, based on some physiological principles that have emerged over the year, looking at the temperature dependent performance uh, curve that you, that you see here, and, and working based on the generalized assumption that this performance curve, which is defining the thermal niche of a species, is in fact influenced by the other climate drivers in the ocean, and that's CO2 and, and uh, reduced oxygen, and both of these would be leading to a narrowing of the uh, thermal niche. So CO2 and hypoxia would be interfering with the change in biogeography of, of any one species, and uh, this current geographical displacement that, w that we see can be explained by a contraction of the biogeographical area on, on the uh, warm side of the thermal window and an expansion on, on the cold side caused by the salmon reflecting the thermal specialization of the organisms and their inability uh, to shift those largely under uh, climate change. Now what is not fully considered in, in this picture 
yet and in the in the modeling as well uh, that we need to distinguish between the different life stages of the species and for Atlantic cod um, uh, this is illustrated here and in the center you see how this the picture is emerging how the thermal specialization develops from um, eggs to larvae to juveniles adults and then adult spawners taking into account the development of uh, their physiological uh, systems and capacities as well as then the shrinking of the thermal window again with increasing body, body size. Now this is interfering and we are looking at the most sensitive life stage, the eggs and embryos here. What you see, uh, the grayish curve reflecting the thermal window and then the reddish curve underneath how this thermal window is actually shrinking and, and constrained uh, by uh, the influence of elevated CO2 or ocean acidification for two species, Atlantic cod, the invader, and polar cod, the species affected by the invasion. And this baseline information with respect to uh, what this means for reproduction success, we took into modeling exercises, looking at how actually the spawning habitat of the species might change in a changing uh, ocean. This is reflecting the starting situation with uh, spawning habitat uh, for Atlantic cod being more suitable around Iceland and the Lofoten and that's where the Barents Sea population also uh, migrates to. And for polar cod, the spawning habitat being most suitable, more suitable in the high Arctic um, for the Atlantic sector in the, in, in the area um, east of uh, uh, Spitsbergen. Now, how is this picture changing under, under climate change? You see how the spawning habitat suitability, depending on the scenario and the global mean surface temperature that we are going for, is actually lost in the south on the left-hand side for Atlantic cod. You see how the brownish area reflects the, the uh, declining suitability of that uh, spawning habitat along the, the, the continental uh, margin and, and the Scandinavian uh, coast moving further into the north, but we don't really know how much um, and how suitable this new environment might be beyond the actual drivers of this of temperature and CO2 and, and, and oxygen. And the loss in spawning habitat suitability is especially strong for polar cod. A conclusion from, from this study was certainly that keeping global warming uh, to, to 1.5 uh, degrees would leave us on the safe side and would constrict and constrain uh, the loss in habitat suitability to an extent that faunal distribution would still end and spawning habitat suitability would still to some extent uh, reflect and be closer to the, the current situation. And this always takes us then to the final slide, which I um, usually show going across the, the um, three special reports that we've produced during the last year, where we say explicitly for many sectors for minimizing impact, severity and associated risks, every bit of warming matters, each year matters, and each choice matters, and, and very clearly but this quantitative understanding is obviously difficult to reach in the policy arena. Closely following 1.5 degree emission trajectories matters uh, based on the political and societal will that needs to be developed. Thank you very much for your attention. So we now have time uh, for a few questions uh, from the audience and for the panel discussion. Um, so if we have the roving microphone um, from Heidi or... So can I ask if anybody in the audience has a question they would like to ask any of the uh, panelists? So, Carol. Um, thank you. Uh, Carol Turley, PML. I, I've got a question for the biologists here, for, for the, the gentleman talking about the changing biology. Um, I find uh, I have a problem with some of the Arctic fisheries models because um, 
and it might be that I'm wrong, uh, is at the moment a lot of the production is, uh, is on the sea ice, the algal production, and the organisms are adapted to grazing actually on the surface. So, uh, and when it becomes ice-free Arctic, then um, the, the types of plankton that will grow, there will be uh, not attached to ice, but free-floating phytoplankton. And presumably, the types of zooplankton will change as well. And how is that change then modified up the system? And do the models actually take that into account? It seems I'm the, the animal person here on the, on the group. So uh, le let me try and, and, and go there. And this is exactly uh, one of the, the questions that I th or uncertainties around the, the modeling results with respect to the shifts in, in, in biogeography. They are not, they, they are considering the changes in overall productivity, not really the, the uh, considering the species composition and, and what is available as food for fish, but, but there is certainly also a consideration of direct impacts of um, environmental drivers on uh, animal organisms, and that is often not considered by uh, ecologists, that not all effect of climate change goes through the food web, but there is a direct impact of temperature, acidification, hypoxia on the species, and they <coughs> respond sometimes more sensitively, and often more sensitively, than, than those smaller creatures that, that are part of their food chain. So, so that uh, to be said, and the models are based on the observation of current temperature dependent distribution and take that into account and project the shifts in, in, in uh, respect to uh, how, how temperatures will be, are moving, how the temperature profiles are moving. Um, that is the background and, and, and very clearly if, if the ecosystem changes, that needs to be considered. Um, it is to some extent considered in terms of ecosystem turnover, um, mixing of species, and that is exactly uh, uh, what will be happening. So projecting how the future ecosystems will be looking like in different places, um, depending on the, their new climate characteristics, is a difficult thing. And we need to improve along uh, those lines. This does not um, eliminate that these first principles are in operation and we see uh, op and, and the observations are supporting that because what we are currently seeing uh, is clearly an increase in, in uh, subarctic arctic cod stocks and, and, and their productivity and increased fishing results. But this, our new data on the spawning habitat suitability indicate that this may be a transient phenomenon because it does not take into account uh, the vulnerability of, of uh, the young uh, life stages, young and spawning life stages, so the two sides of the spectrum. So I can, I can add a little bit to that. Um, within the Changing Arctic Ocean program, there are a couple of um, projects looking at prey-predator relationships, but amongst the, the the phytoplankton and the zooplankton and looking specifically at the timing of the blooms and if they, t if they are produced in time to feed the zooplankton and then also the life cycle of for example callanus and how precarious that is in, with respect to changes in pH temperature and oxygen and presence or absence of sea ice. Okay, are there any other questions from the audience? It's a related question, really. Um, do, do with these changes in uh, life cycles and the, uh, the the areas in which the phytoplankton blooms occur and the, the zooplankton, where the zooplankton accumulate, what is the effect on um, migrating organisms such as whales or birds? Do, is this going to are these changes going to have an effect on biodiversity is there anything known about that at all I think that's another question for the biologist um, <laughs> which, which is not me 
Well, well, again, I can only extrapolate from, from, from the global models where certainly the emphasis in what is happening in terms of biodiversity currently in, in the tropics in, in terms of them being kind of, well, there's a trend towards tropical latitudes being cleared of biodiversity due to this overarching trend of, of species moving out of the places that get too warm for them. And, and on the a higher latitude side, especially the picture in the Arctic, in, in, in the North, North Atlantic towards the Arctic, is a little unclear. There are some high, hypotheses that, for example, for areas like the North Sea, it's not only the warming trend that is, is important, but it's also the, the velocity of climate change that is in, important in, in, in making it difficult for uh, biodiversity to be maintained. We currently see an increase because of the invasion of lucidant species from, from, from further south, but um, this, this may again only be a transient um, uh, ph phenomenon. And the Arctic, paralleled by a decline in endemic fauna, we can say yes, there will be invasion of species to what extent they find suitable conditions like think about the long winters and low light conditions and then the consequences for food availability. What, what, it, what does this mean for, for biodiversity? Open question. Further research needed. Okay. I, I have uh, one slightly cheeky question um, for Tim. Um, what sort of plans does uh, Germany in a very broad sense have uh, for future uh, research in the Arctic? Um, and especially future international collaborative research. Yes, thank you. Um, in the Arctic region, region as well as in Antarctica, uh, we think that international cooperation is, is key because of the very complex infrastructure that is needed there. And uh, thus we have, um, as I mentioned, furthered the international dialogue on the future Arctic research perspectives. Um, the Arctic Science Ministerial that was started by the US in 2016 and then taken up by um, Germany, the uh, European Commission and Finland in 2018 was a very good cornerstone on this future perspective. We have the joint statement signed by the ministers, by the representatives and we have this working group uh, that will develop uh, future scenarios of Arctic research, future priorities that we can then uh, implement in, in research plans and programs and uh, we also plan to have a national stakeholder involvement process we call them agenda processes um, that have um, a very good outcome in, in terms of uh, future research priorities that are set by scientists scientists tell us what what the current highlights are and what they think is vital for the future and we take that up and transform it and uh, build research programs out of this. Mm -hmm. And hopefully we'll see some very positive outcomes uh, and benefits from the uh, collaboration between the UK and Germany in the Changing Arctic Ocean program as well. When yes, it, when it finally indeed, comes because it is one of the great, <laughs> the greatest um, funding program from from BMBF in the Arctic region, and uh, also Mosaic will will set uh, more and um, different priorities. I think. Great, thank you, Tim. So unless there are any other questions, I would like to thank the speakers for a series of great talks um, and uh, thank the audience for attending. So, thank you. Thank you.